Hello, everybody. I'm Doug Sonnenberg, lead pastor at Bethany Church. Welcome, Bethany. Buenos dias. Esperanza viva. Here we are, our uh, second Sunday of online worship, and um, it's hard to say how much longer we'll be doing this. And so we're adapting. We're choosing peace over panic, faith over fear. One of the Bible verses I'm reminded of is from Isaiah 41, verse 10, where uh, the prophet is saying, he heard God saying this, fear not, for I'm with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you, I will help you, I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. You know, it's times like this that we remember this. And though today we might be feeling a little bit uh, separated, keep in mind we're all, we are united, we are together with God and with each other. And in all seriousness, if you just need to hear a voice, just say hi to somebody. Give a call to the church office. We are always ready just to say hi, how are you doing, and keep us connected. So God bless you as we worship together this weekend. Hey everyone, this is Laura here, and I want to take a moment and just go ahead and let you know how we can continue to stay connected, even though we are all on this virtual platform right now. And so if you are watching from home today, we want to know that. And so we want you to go ahead and take out your phones and text the word virtual um, to the number here on the screen. All you have to do is put the word virtual and then once you send it, then you'll get a response to go ahead and put your name and who is that's watching with you at home today. Um, while you have your phones out, go ahead and pull up the YouVersion Bible app. It's a great app, even if you're not using it on Sunday mornings in the sermon. But particularly on Sundays, our sermon and the notes and the Bible verses that Pastor Doug is going to be referencing, as well as some announcements, are found in this app. And so all you have to do is go ahead and use the location settings, go to more events, and search Bethany Church. And you should find today's sermon listed on the app. You should have gotten an email this week that is just keeping you up to date of everything going on. Um, we are trying our best to come up with some new ways to stay connected and help you stay connected as the body. And so in your email, be sure you check out that. We've overhauled the website with some resources, um, especially some family resources for young kids, for teenagers, um, for our small groups, our discipling partnerships. There's plenty on there. So we encourage you to go check that out at BethanyChurchOH.org. Um, and also going on, we are trying out some new things. We've got some virtual groups going. We hope that if you are not a part of a group, that you can go ahead and join into a virtual journey group. And there's a sign up both on the website and in your e-news. And we're offering Wednesday night prayer groups, um, 7.30 Wednesday night. There's a Zoom link. And all you have to do is log on on your computer or your phone. And we are just joining together in prayer. Um, and we are wanting to make sure that we are taking care of anybody who is in need. And so if you at any time during this um, pandemic need some help, please don't hesitate. We've got teams who are calling people and checking in, but you can also call the office at any time and let us know if you need help or if you want to be a part of reaching out to people running errands. Don't hesitate to call or use the Sign Up Genius link in your e-news. And so I will go ahead and turn it over and we'll get started with some worship music. Lord, I'm on my knees again. Lord, I'm begging, please again, I need you. I need you
water on my skin.
I'm so happy to welcome you to our time of prayer together. If you're in a group today, please pause for just a few moments and ask yourselves these three questions, and after that, we'll pray together. Question number one, what are you thankful for today? Question number two, what are you feeling most stressed about? And question number three, whom do we know that is in need of help? And how can we work together to make that happen? Welcome back. Now let's join our hearts together in a time of prayer. Heavenly Father, we're grateful to have this new way of gathering to worship you and to hear your word. In our various locations and times of worship, may your spirit draw us close to Christ. We confess that we are stunned by the many disruptions that are shake, shaking this world and shattering the routines of our daily lives. Help us, Father, overcome our many anxieties and to face our challenges and to experience your help and your hope. Forgive us, Father, for our blindness to the blessings that you've always given to us in ordinary days. You've offered so faithfully gifts of daily bread, meaningful work, fellowship with family and friends, and sufficient health to enjoy each moment. Father, in these days of threats, threats to our health, our income, and needed resources, teach us grateful trust for your providing grace. Give wisdom to our leaders in every community and nation to lead us forward through our distressed condition. We pray for our medical researchers as they seek effective treatments and we pray especially for healing mercy for those whose health is threatened. We pray for protection for their physicians and their medical staff as they treat those who are ill. Help Father our Christian pastors and teachers by inspiring a spirit of love, generosity, faith, and courage throughout your church. And now unite our hearts to pray as Christ taught us pray to pray, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, today's sermon um, here in a few minutes, it's going to be about going all in for Jesus. And right now we recognize that it is an incredibly uncertain time, not just in terms of our health, but in terms of our economy. And so we want to encourage you to continue to just trust that God will provide and one of those steps that you can do is to continue to give. I know a lot of you each week faithfully put a check in the offering plate, but that's not really an option right now. And so we want to go ahead and give you a few minutes to be able to go write that check and um, address it. You can take a few minutes and set up online bill pay through your bank and have that mailed into the church. Or we have a give option. Either you can text the word give to the same number that you checked in at today or go straight to our website. And these are great options because you can set up reoccurring payments through that. And so you don't have to worry about it um, anymore. So those are a few options. And so I'll go ahead and just pray. And and I'll give you a few minutes to go ahead and do that. God, our Father, um, we thank you so much for all that you have provided for us. Um, Lord, we thank you that um, you have just blessed us abundantly um, in so many ways through our relationships or our church um, and through economic means, Lord. And we recognize that during this time, there are so many around us who 
are doing without, who um, are facing scarcity, who are unsure where their next meal is coming from, Lord. And so we just ask that you take this money and you multiply it out for your community um, so that people's earthly needs may be met, but Lord, more importantly, that they can experience who you are um, and that we as your church can demonstrate the love of Christ through our actions. And so, Lord, we just ask that you bless this um, all in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, who gave it all for us. Amen. This weekend, we are blessed to be reminded that disciples come in all ages. And we have a couple of our young disciples here to remind us that one of the things God wants us to do as disciples is memorize the scripture. Reagan and Gideon Greg have our troopers when it comes to scripture memory. So say with them this verse as they recite our scripture memory verse for the month. Come, Jesus said, come to me, all fall away, and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Matthew eleven twenty eight. Awesome. Great job. Pretty cool. <laughs> Today we're continuing the series, Jesus is Renewal. We've been talking for a few weeks now about Sabbath rest and how that's a key part of the life rhythm that God's designed for us. Today I wanna kind of jump from that to uh, being all in for Jesus. How Sabbath rest is one of the ways that God prepares us so that we can be all in for Jesus. I tell you, in the circumstances that we're living in now, we have a great opportunity to reveal what it means to be all in for Jesus. Everything from when we uh, make those necessary runs to the grocery store to when we're interacting with schoolmates or workmates, whether it's via Zoom or phone or however, but I uh, want to talk today about being all in for Jesus. Also want to mention that since we are doing online or virtual worship, we're going to experiment with a few different things. And today, Bill already during the prayer uh, invited you to kind of pause and have a little bit of conversation. I'm going to do the same thing here near the beginning of the sermon. We're going to stop, and if you're if you're with some folks, you can stop and have a conversation together. If you're by yourself, just stop and do some contemplation on the question as well. But we're, uh, again, just uh, as we're charting these new waters, we're, we're uh, asking God to help us make this uh, an engaged and um, inspiring time of worship together. So our passage today, our primary passage, is from the Apostle Paul's letter to the church in Rome. It's Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 11. Well then, should we keep on sinning so that God can show us more and more of his wonderful grace? Of course not. Since we've died to sin, how can we continue to live in it? Or have you forgotten that when we were joined with Christ Jesus in baptism, we joined him in his death? For we died and were buried with Christ by baptism. And just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father, now we also may live new lives. Okay, now in just a moment, I'm going to invite you to pause the video. I want you to do uh, three things uh, during these paused moments. First of all, somebody, and if you're by yourself, obviously it's you, but if you're with a group, somebody in the group, just kind of recap the verses that I just read. I mean, don't, don't read it right from your Bible, but just kind of say, what was it that Paul was talking about? And then after you've done that, uh, talk about these two questions. For, uh, what does this say about God, Jesus, or their plan for the world? And then finally, what does this say about people? Take just a couple minutes to do these three things, and then I'll see you here in just a moment. All right, welcome back. You did pause it, didn't you? You know, why did I have you do that? I, I've found that one of the best ways to begin to discover and remember what the Bible says is to simply repeat back 
what you heard. And then talk about those two simple questions. What does it say about God or Jesus? What does it say about people? You know, this is part of the discovery Bible study format that we talk a lot about. The idea is that you can dig into the Bible and discover what it says without ever having read it before, or you may have read it for 20, 30 years, but we can bring new converts in with longtime believers and together discover what God is saying. So uh, uh, so hope you uh, took part in that and because we'll be doing more and more of that in the, in the uh, days ahead head. You know, this, uh, today I want to share with you some thoughts about our subject, about that is being, what does it mean to be all in for Jesus? Now, again, what I'm saying now is not intended to be like looking at the answers in the back of the book compared to what you were just talking about. But my hope is this message will actually prompt more conversation. Again, particularly in light of the circumstances in which we currently find ourselves about being all in for Jesus. To kind of kick things off, uh, we've got a video a uh, somewhat uh, humorous, fun video of some of our um, folks from Bethany that were really kind of practicing for themselves what it means to be fully committed, to be all in. Here, watch and listen here for just a moment. Wow, I tell you, talking about being all in, fully committed, once they were out there, there was no turning back. And you know, uh, really, that's what God wants for us. That when we commit to being all in for Jesus and he renews us, we have our Sabbath rest, we have our times of work that we're all in. We're not lukewarm, we're all in for Jesus. Before we uh, take a little bit more of an in-depth look at the Bible passage from Romans 6, I want to comment a bit about this uh, scenario in which we do find ourselves. These are certainly what's called, I've heard the term, unprecedented times, at least for us in our lifetime. Uh, but you know what? There have been some times historically in which life rhythms have been altered due to the spreading of disease. In fact, altered not just through what we might call pretty significant inconveniences, but civilizations have actually experienced devastating losses. In fact, widespread death. Let, let's look first at how Christians, that is those who are all in for Jesus, those who surrender their life to the following of Jesus, how Christians have responded and impacted a few of these times historically. There's a book titled The Rise of Christianity. It's written by author Rodney Stark. And in this book, he explores that which contributed to the rapid expansion of what he calls, as far as the Christian faith, a dominant force from what's historically referred to as what was an obscure marginal Jesus movement. And one of the most significant historical occurrences was the Christian community's remarkable responses to plagues. And may we really today with this own pandemic live out the wisdom and the way of Jesus before a watching world. Let's go back to the year AD 165, Roman Empire in AD 165, while Marcus Aurelius was emperor. There was a plague that struck. Now I know some of my history nerd friends are gonna say I, I murdered that name, but anyway, Marcus Aurelius was emperor. There was a plague that struck the uh, empire at that time. Some thought it might've been smallpox. Over a 15 year period, it killed a quarter to a third of the people of the Roman Empire. And author um, Stark estimates that at that time, there were about 
45,000 Christians in existence. That was just 0.08% of the entire empire. So a small, small portion of the empire. But despite their numbers, the Christian response to this pandemic won admiration and a greater following. Dionysius, the Bishop of Alexandria, he reported this, talking about what, what had happened. He said, most of our brother Christians showed unbounded love and loyalty, never sparing themselves and thinking only of one another. Heedless of danger, they took charge of the sick, attending to their every need and ministering to them in Christ and with them departed this life serenely happy. Did you catch that? Many of them died taking care of those who had been sick for, for they were infected by others with the disease, drawing on themselves the sickness of their neighbors and cheerfully accepting their pains. The bishop goes on to write, many in nursing and then curing others transferred their death to themselves and they actually died in some cases in their stead. This evident Christ-likeness, taking death in order to give life, stood in stark contrast to those outside the church. Bishop Dionysius continues. He says, but with the heathen, everything was quite otherwise. They deserted those who began to be sick and fled from their dearest friends. They shunned any participation or fellowship with death, which yet with all their precautions, it was not easy for them to escape. Plagues intensify the natural course of life. They intensify our own sense of mortality and frailty. They also intensify opportunities to display countercultural, counterconditional love. And the church rose to the challenge way back in the second century, winning both admirers and also converts. And so if you wanna know how Christianity went from an obscure and marginal movement to representing around 6 million believers by AD 300, author Rodney Stark will tell you plagues were a huge factor. Well, let's jump ahead several centuries to AD 1527. 1527 in, in the city of Wittenberg. From the 14th century onward, the Black Death haunted Europe. And in just five years from the 14th century, it wiped out as much as half of the population with urban areas particularly affected. Outbreaks continued recurring in the following centuries, including the plague that struck Wittenberg in 1527. Many fled, yet Martin Luther and his pregnant wife, Katharina, remained to care for the sick. They cited Matthew 25, verses 41 to 46 as their guide. Luther says this, he says, we must respect the word of Christ. I was sick and you visited me. According to this passage, we're bound to each other, Luther says, in such a way that no one may forsake the other in his distress, but is obliged to assist and help him as he himself would like to be helped. Luther spoke of circumstances where fleeing was permitted and ever conscious of our propensity towards self-righteousness, he warned Christians not to judge one another for different decisions they were making about whether to stay or whether to go. But in writing of his own commitment, he remarked this, we are here alone with the deacons, but Christ is present too, that we may not be alone. And he will triumph in us over that old serpent, murderer, and author of sin, however much he may bruise Christ's heel. Pray for us and farewell. Luther fully expected that he and his wife would probably die. But Luther and Katharina both survived. And the way of Jesus was vindicated in this intense trial. You know, there are many factors that set our age today apart from others. Before modern hospitals, there was no specialized professional health care. What's more, previous generations ministered to the sick with little knowledge of how their diseases were actually transmitted. Carers could be carriers, even when asymptomatic. 
In such scenarios, self-isolation can be the most loving thing to do. I know some of you have already experienced that, these periods of necessary self-isolation rather than infecting the ones that you're seeking to love. While the outworking of love may look different in different ages, love must still be the aim, a love directed by the Holy Spirit, not by our self-centered flesh. So just as our brothers and sisters before us did, may we live all in for Jesus Christ, the rock, knowing that he alone can and he alone will help us weather this storm. Let's love our neighbors moving in Christ toward those in need. And may God be pleased to work again through this trial to glorify Christ's name and extend his kingdom. I wanted to share with you something we received this week from one of our uh, young uh, members. Uh, we got some incredible artwork from uh, Marcus Huster as he uh, drew this picture showing being all in for Jesus. And he's showing Jesus here saying, I will fight you, co uh, coronavirus. I trust the Lord. Oh, wait, that's a Jesus follower holding his Bible saying, I'll fight you because I have Jesus. And here I, I am, COVID-19. COVID and uh, fight. Right, so uh, Marcus, thanks so much for, as you're uh, home from school, uh, taking some time to express through your artwork how uh, Jesus is helping his people, helping us in the world to fight this uh, virus, the spread of this virus. So let me ask you again, what does it mean to be all in for Jesus? Again, during the past weeks, we've explored the importance of Sabbath rest, how Sabbath rest is vitally important I don't know, I hope you've been taking some time to be intentional about setting aside those moments each day and that day each week. I'm finding now as I'm increasing my level of intentionality to make one of the days during the week, I'm working on Saturday being a day of Sabbath rest, I'm asking questions. I was talking with my wife, Beth, about things like, so if I do taxes this Saturday, is that Sabbath rest or not? And again, we gotta watch that we don't get legalistic, we don't get Pharisaic about it. But I think uh, the, the point is that God wants us to enjoy some time of rest and closeness with him. But as wonderful as that is, Sabbath rest by in and of itself won't bring about a permanent renewal in your life apart from being all in for Christ every day of your life. I mean, you might be rested, but rested for what? What does it mean to be completely surrendered, completely renewed and immersed in Christ? From the very beginning of Christianity, followers of Jesus indicated they were all in or immersed in Christ by being baptized. Baptized, immersed in the water and then rising up, completely soaked, physically on the outside, spiritually soaked on the inside. You know, when you stop and think about it, the, the sacrament of baptism to someone who had never heard of such a thing could seem kind of weird. I mean, I picture a conversation, something like this. So, so you've decided to follow this, this man, this, this son of God, as you call him, known as Jesus? Yep. That's right, that's right. So, so what's involved? I mean, do they have you sign some kind of a membership agreement? Do you agree to pay some kind of dues? Do you have a country club like uh, headquarters or something? Well, not exactly. Well, what do you mean? Well, what I actually do is I agree to die. To die? Yeah, to, to die to self and to live for him. Well, that seems kind of extreme. Oh, it is. It is extreme. You're either all in or you're not. So what do you do to demonstrate that you're all in? Well, you get baptized. You receive Jesus as your Savior and your Lord. You acknowledge that there's sin in your life, something separating you from God, and you receive him as the Savior and the one that reconciles you with God. And then you get ready for a life of following him. You get what's called baptized. In fact, the word baptized comes from the Greek word baptizo. 
Greek, the New Testament was originally written in Greek. And so we have the Greek word baptizo. Baptizo, or to baptize, for example, a, um, that word was used when talking about a, a cloth or a garment that was going to be immersed in dye to uh, change colors. And so when you took that, that cloth or that garment and you dipped it into the colored dye, the liquid dye, and you pulled it out, it would be totally transformed. In a sense, a new cloth, a new garment. Its very fibers would be changed, never to be the same again, never going back. Spiritually speaking, that's what happens to a person when he or she surrenders his or her life to Jesus receives him as Savior and Lord, and is baptized first by the Holy Spirit, which we then demonstrate by water baptism as we celebrate. Well, that seems kind of weird. Well, I mean, how do you know if you're immersed in Jesus, spiritually speaking? It's a great question. Only God knows for sure but one of the ways we know is, is we have the, something called the fruit of the Spirit. You display love and joy and peace, and then you live as his disciple. There's three indicators to indicate that you're a disciple of Jesus. First of all, you follow him, which means you follow his commandments in your life. Secondly, you're being changed by him continuously as you follow him more and more and become more and more holy. And third, you're fulfilling his mission which of course is to go to all the nations and make disciples. Following Jesus does seem weird at times, especially in the midst of all the current chaos, the current circumstances. Again, consider how Christians have responded historically to times really similar to this. They went in to be with the diseased people because they were all in for Jesus. So what about today? Are you and I, are we to go and be with people who are ill, with diseased people? You know, in some cases, the answer could be yes. Yes, you are. But of course, we're called also to be wise. God gives us wisdom and knowledge to help us in decision-making as we move forward. So, but how, so let's start, rather than, um, than that example, let's start with some examples that any follower of Jesus could do. First, one thing that comes to mind is we don't hoard. We don't hoard, but instead we share. We share our food. We share our toilet paper. I mean, spare a square, right? Help a brother or sister out. We check in on elderly neighbors, we keep in touch with others, especially those who might be living alone, no matter what their age is. In fact, we're setting up a phone ministry here at Bethany. Give a call to the office if you'd like to help be a part of that. You, you have a general demeanor as a follower of Jesus that you choose peace over panic. You choose faith over fear. Not that at times we don't feel some nervousness, that we don't experience some anxiety. Of course we do but that's where we turn to the Lord and each other and we continue on with peace and with faith. You know, there's some things we can't do right now that we'd like to. For example, here at Bethany Church, we'd like to offer the Family Life Center to a large group, but we can't do that with the restrictions. So maybe there's other examples that you can do. Perhaps your neighbor's kids, you can help take care of your neighbor's kids and lots of possibilities. And you know, fortunately, God's word has a lot to say about being all in for Jesus. Let's take another quick look at Romans chapter six, the first few verses. In verses one and two, the apostle Paul is saying this. Now he'd been talking to the, this group of church people, of followers of Jesus, about how, you know, we're called to not sin, but when we do sin... We're not lost forever. God's grace is always greater than our sin. And so as though someone's saying, oh, so I really need to make God look good, so I should just keep on sinning, right? And, that, and that's where we jump in Romans 6, chapter one. He says, well then, should we keep on sinning so that God can show us more and more of his wonderful grace? You know, when I hear that question, I, I see Paul saying, come here, come here, here, walk into this, walk into this. Of course not. Since we've died to sin, how can we continue to live in it? 
And then he goes on in verses three and four. Or have you forgotten that when we were joined with Christ Jesus in baptism, we joined with him in his death? For we died and were buried with Christ by baptism. Let me pause there for just a moment. When you think of baptism, now I am today talking about immersion and I know in the United Methodist traditions and some other traditions you have sprinkling. And so we see the water as symbolic of what the Holy Spirit's doing. But today, just, just stay with me. And we're thinking about immersion in a large baptistry or a pool or a pond. And so when you think about, first you have the person standing up. And that represents their life before Christ. Then as the person is immersed into the water, they go underneath the water and that represents dying with Christ. And they're there for just a moment, hopefully. And then you pull them up out of the water and the water runs off of them. And now they're soaked completely. And that represents coming to be alive with Christ. The next verse says this, it says, and just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father, now we also may live new lives. So verse five goes on to say this. Since we've been united with him in his death, we also will be raised to life as he was. We know that our old sinful selves were crucified with Christ so that now, now catch this, this is a key phrase, so that sin might lose its power in our lives. We are no longer slaves to sin. What's Paul saying there? We read in the Bible, the wages of sin, the price paid for sin is what is death. And so we live our lives without knowing the redemption of Christ, knowing that one day every one of us is gonna die. And there's fear involved with that. I'm afraid to die. And then there's power in that fear. And so what Paul is telling the church then, and what he's saying to you and me today, is that when we're all in for Christ, it means we shared with him in his death, but we live with him in that resurrected life. He says in verse seven, for when we died with Christ, we were set free from the power of sin. And I'll just share one more verse. It says, and since we died with Christ, we know we will also live with him. We will also live with him. So what God is telling us here as he speaks through Paul is that when you're all in for Jesus, it means you no longer have to fear death itself. That God has promised you that there is life after death. Not only promised, but he revealed that promise through Jesus Christ. After three days, Jesus rose from the dead and hundreds of people saw him until then he rose back to heaven. So God is saying, this is what I'm promising you. So you have nothing to fear. So when those people of centuries ago went to help those who were sick by the plague, I have to think like you and I, they didn't want to get sick, but they knew if they got sick and they died, that their life was not over. And Jesus was the proof of that. And so God is telling us, live your life in such a way, not foolishly. If we have wisdom and knowledge, that we won't get sick? Well, of course, make use of that knowledge and that wisdom, but live your life in such a way that the power of sin is defeated, that you love Jesus for what he's done and that you're joining with him, setting aside your old ways and saying, Lord Jesus, I am all in for you. So that's the question today. What about you? Are you all in for Jesus? Will you stand strong in obedience to him, even when, especially when, you may be labeled as weird? You know, now that Sabbath rest is becoming a part of your life rhythm, how will you apply that rest so that whether you're resting or when you are rested and working, you do so as an all-in follower of Jesus? You know, as we wrap this up today, I, 
I urge you to take a moment to consider what is your I will statement this week? Because we are having one opportunity after another. It may seem in small ways, you know, share a brother. I mean, we're, we're humorous about it, but there's truth to it. Share with a brother or sister, a roll of toilet paper if you need it, or if you need some food, share it with them. Or maybe someone just needs a phone call to know because they've been looking at their walls day after day and just say, hey man, just wanna let you know, I love you, you're not alone. We're gonna make it through this together. And I tell you, when this does come to an end, man, are we going to celebrate being able to, you know, do, do the chest bumps and the fist bumps and the hugs and everything else. Isn't it true that we find when something's taken away from us, we begin to realize just how valuable it is? I mean, again, the principle of fasting. When we don't eat, we realize and we get hungry. We realize, Lord, thank you for providing us food. So now when we don't shake hands and we don't hug, we begin to say, wow, Lord, thank you for these gifts in our life. May we never take even the simple things lightly. So I pray that you and I will have a statement, something like this, I will not only give thanks for Jesus' death, which provides forgiveness for my sin, but I will be all in for Jesus, recognizing that through him, I am freed from the power of sin. My mortal body may come to an end one day, but I will not ever die. And I can live in such a way that glorifies God. Here's a short and simple way to put it. In other words, I'm all in. I will live for Jesus, period. Let me pray with you. Lord Jesus, as we come to you here today, Lord, we consider who you are and how you gave everything on the cross so that we could be forgiven of sin, reconciled with God the Father, and have the life that you offer first here on earth and then in your heavenly kingdom. Lord Jesus, today, Thank you, thank you for having mercy on us and forgiving us when we've been kind of lukewarm, kind of half-hearted. Today, Lord Jesus, I pray that we would all uh, be baptized, remember our baptism, be immersed in you, and that we would live our lives as all-in followers for you. Whether it's just helping out a neighbor across the street or it's offering our life for someone else. Lord, whatever that takes, may we offer ourselves all in for you as individuals and as the body of Christ together. May the world see a love like no other through your people, followers of Jesus. Let it be so, Lord Jesus, let it be so. It's in your name we pray these things and give you thanks, amen. God bless you all. It's always a blessing to be with you, even if it's online and virtual. Keep the faith. God is with us. He's got it. We'll see you soon. Take care. God bless. Thanks, Pastor Doug, for that message today. And so we encourage you this week um, to make sure that you not only have just heard the word, but that you become doers of the word. And so we want to know um, how that you are going to be all in for Jesus. What is your I will statement? And so um, share that out on social media. Please stay in contact with us. Let us know how we can serve you during this time and just take care. God bless. We will see you online.